This is Mrs. O'Neill for Chapter 4, Section 1, Atomic Structure. So first thing is first, those vocabulary words, repeat after me. You're either doing this out loud or you're doing this whispering, but you should say them so you get the idea of what, uh, how to pronounce them. So, atom, atomic mass, atomic mass unit, AMU, atomic number, cathode ray, Dalton's atomic theory, Electron, isotope, mass number, neutron, nucleus, and proton. Now most of these you've seen or heard of before, so this chapter should be relatively easy because uh, you've probably seen this either in your physical science, maybe in middle school, or in a little bit of biology as well. So just like before, watch the rest of this video to get the notes, um, and in class you'll have time to write down the definitions. Again, to write those definitions, I strongly suggest looking through the chapter, but there's also that glossary in the back page, R, standing for reference, 118. And why are you doing this? because of that vocab quiz that will be coming in the future. So section one is about defining the atom, and in this section you're going to describe Democritus' idea about the atom, explain Dalton's atomic theory, and identify this instrument used to observe individual atoms. So you should have watched that intro information on the history of the atom. So this was a nice preview. I'm going to go through these notes rather quickly. So first he looked at that helium atom and he said that the center is the nucleus, but then he gave you this uh, conversion, let me say, or an understanding of how small these atoms and this nucleus is. And he talked about the femtometers, and that actually was one of those prefix units um, when you did the conversion factors. I believe that was section 3.3, .3, and I gave you a whole list of prefixes and and that actually was on there. So he also talked about the history and how it became known that even these atoms exist and how the protons, neutrons, and electrons are organized. So he went through a lot here as a nice preview of this chapter. He talked about Mendeleev, that he was a Russian scientist and he was actually the first one to start organizing these properties of these elements, which came to the modern periodic table that we know of today. So he talked about the history of the atom, and there's so many guys involved, but the ones that you really need to keep track of uh, are the ones that are in your notes. But this was, again, a nice preview of all these different scientists and how they all played a part in understanding what the atom is uh, and what it looks like and what it's made of today. He talked about Democritus. He was actually a Greek philosopher, and he's the very, very first one that thought of, oh, if we keep, if we take something that's tangible and we keep dividing it and dividing it and dividing it, at some point you're going to get something so small, and he actually called them atomos. And again, we're going to get to that later on, uh, either in this section, this chapter, at some point. And atomos just means indivisible, which means you can't break them down any further. And that's what makes an atom an atom. Atom, right? Something that you can't break down any further. So he talked about all of these different scientists. Uh, John Dalton, how he came up with what's known as the atomic theory today, he talked about those atoms hooking together uh, in a specific ratio, making those bonds. He talked about J.J. Thomas's cathode ray tube that to help discover the electron. Rutherford used a gold foil experiment, and he talked about these alpha particles and how they hit the screen. And again, we'll talk more about that uh, in, in a later section, but he really discovered the nucleus and the fact that it has a positive charge. So again, Rutherford model came up with that there's a positive middle and that there's, there's electrons floating around the outside, but the atom itself is mostly empty space. Then Niels Bohr, he came up with the fact that, well, wait a minute, these positive and negative charges, they're attracted to each other. So Rutherford's model didn't really work. So Bohr said, well, I'm going to say that these electrons have to be on some kind of specific orbit. Now, we're not going to call them orbits anymore. We're going to call them... Uh, you've known them as orbitals, maybe, or shells. We're going to call them as energy levels. And the reason for that is because electrons have a lot of energy. And depending on which energy level they're on is going to tell us how much energy they actually have. But Bohr said, well, these electrons are going to be on specific um, 
specific orbits uh, or paths around that nucleus, around that uh, that positive charge. So they're not going to run into each other, right? They're not going to. They're going to be attracted to each other, but they're not going to run into each other. Then this Schrodinger man, he's he's really popular because he said, "All right, these electrons really aren't particles, but they're waves." So he came up with what's called the quantum physics. And remember, physics is all about movement. So he said, "Well, if these electrons are 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 are, are particles, uh, but they're also considered waves, uh, these waves are going to give us different wavelengths and different frequencies." Something you're going to learn in chapter five. Chadwick discovered the neutron, and it took a long time to discover that neutron because it doesn't have a charge. Then we come up with the Heisenberg, uh, and that Heisenberg said, well, you know what, Bohr and Schrodinger, they're both right, because the electron can be a particle and it can be a wave. And this is where we came up with this quantum theory on how these electrons move. And if you take AP chemistry, um, we really go in depth as to uh, what the Schrodinger really wanted, or I'm sorry, what Heisenberg really was trying to, to give us an understanding of how these electrons are particles and waves. So in this uh, course, we're just going to kind of skim the surface. So off to your packet of notes. It is. It often helps to take a closer look. For example, you might walk up to a sign or a poster in order to make out the details. Or you might bring a set of binoculars to a sports stadium so that you can zoom in on the action. The lab technician shown here is using a magnifying lens to examine a bacterial culture in a petri dish. Scientists use many different devices that enhance their ability to see. However, scientists can't always see the details of what they study. In such cases, scientists try to obtain experimental data that helps them fill in the picture. Remember, scientists are going to use a lot of models to help us explain stuff that we cannot see, whether they're really, really small or really, really large. Thought that was cute. You want to pause and read that over? See where you get the CU and TE from? Hmm, maybe those are element symbols. So the atom, again, pause the video, fill in the blanks, and then play to hear my words. This is the best definition I've ever found in my so many years of teaching, that the atom is really the simplest form of matter that can still be identified as that element. Once you get smaller than an atom, you are no longer identifying that element as that element. Now it's become something else. So I really like this definition of an atom. So a little bit of history. First, 500 BC, whew, boy, was that a long time ago. They actually thought everything was made up of these four elements. Why? Because they could actually see or feel this, right? They could feel the air. They know they were standing on Earth. They, they did introduce fire and, of course, the water of the ocean. So they thought, well, if these are the four things that we can see, those are the four things that everything is made out of. thought that was a pretty cool picture. Again, a little joke. So again, now we have Democritus, and he was a Greek philosopher. Now remember, philosophers back then just had thoughts. And he's the one who said, okay, I'm going to divide everything up, and if I make something small enough, that tiny, tiny, tiny little thing is going to be called Atomos because it's now indivisible or indestructible. But again, remember, he only had beliefs. This was just in his mind. He didn't really have any proof that this, was, uh, that this really existed. So again, look at that time frame. So, again, read as you write. So he said that these atoms are the building blocks of matter, right? Everything is made up of matter. So all of this matter that we have, all again, anything that's liquid, solid, or gas, anything, all this matter that we know everything can be classified under, uh, we know are made up of these atoms because they're the building blocks. So John Dalton, ooh, look at that, 1800s. So you went all the way from B.C. to 1800s. And he actually was an English chemist and a school teacher. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, he actually took other people's experiments. And he's like, well, look at the evidence from this experiment and look at the evidence from that experiment. So now he's saying because of this proof, he can come up with what is known as the atomic theory. So because... Again, pause. Make sure you're filling in and reading as you're writing. So you should have filled in all that. Now you should have paused and filled in all that. Um, because of those scientists and because of what he was reading and because of all these experiments, he come, came up with these mostly these four main ideas. All elements are composed of atoms, and they're really, really small. 
to A, that atoms of the same element are identical, to B, atoms of different elements are different, three, they unite in whole number ratios, right? We can't have half of an atom, and four, atoms cannot be created or destroyed. Now, I did skip over this real quick because this really wasn't discovered until later. The isotopes really weren't discovered till later, so that's not part of his theory. So, by the way, why is this still a theory? Remember, we still have yet to actually see atoms. We are getting close because of what's called the scanning tunneling microscope, which we'll see towards the end here. Uh, but he, uh, he, he, this is still a theory because it's not, still not 100%, okay? So that's the only part of his theory that is incorrect. So let's look at this visually. Again, this is the first part. Atoms are composed of tiny things called atoms. This is the second part. They're all the same. We know that that's not true, though, because of isotopes. And we'll talk more in detail about isotopes later on in the, um, uh, in the chapter. Of course, different elements are different. Atoms of different elements are different. They combine in whole numbers, right? This looks like water to me. Two H's with one oxygen, right? They have to be whole numbers. And the law of conservation of mass says that, okay, if we start out here with four H's, we have to end with four H's. We start with two O's, we better end with two O's. So I want you to pause and in your notes, make sure that you're writing, or I should say drawing, I have them labeled already, but draw what the atom looks like over this period of time. And here's two more as well. So you might have to kind of go back and forth. That's not to be as detailed and you don't have to worry about all this jibber jobberish on the bottom, but it would be a nice read. But just to give you an idea of how the atom kind of developed over time with all of these different scientists. So the scanning tunneling microscope is this instrument that's actually used to scan the surface of an object so we can finally start seeing what these atoms truly look like. So this is a big monster, right? This is a microscope. This is just an ordinary microscope, but it, it look at this, this monstrosity thing here that is called the scanning tunneling microscope. And all this is doing is this. It's scanning the surface. So we have this little tip here, this little tip, right, is scanning the surface of whatever this object is and what happens is you see these little bumps and when there's this big atom you get a bigger bump and when you have this bigger atom you get this bigger bump so all this is happening is that these electrons are kind of skimming the surface this tip of these electrons are skimming the surface and as they're skimming the surface they're getting these bumps and these bumps show us this look at this I think this is pretty awesome so if you take a piece of iron and you take the scanning tunneling microscope again scanning the surface of this piece of iron you actually get it looks like waves doesn't it look like almost like um you know when you're when, when you're at the ocean or in a lake right you have get these waves but notice that these bumps are not all the same so you have all of these like these kind of look like Hershey kisses to me and these look like waves so we're starting we're finally starting to see what these atoms truly look like but again, we didn't get so inside the atom yet to know the electrons, protons, and neutrons. So we're just skimming the surface so far. I thought that was kind of cute. All right, let's see. Can you take this quick quiz? Again, read, pause, or I should say pause, read, and then come up with an answer. So hopefully you got that. And again, pause, read. Did you get that as an answer? And I believe this is the last question. Hopefully you came up with that answer because, again, that's the only thing that we talked about here. Okay, we will see you in class.